you for joining us for today's Straight Out of Queensland webinar. Um, and today we're going to be talking about AI and machine learning for defence and national security. Before we start, I'd like to uh, pay my respects uh, and acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands on which we are variously meeting uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so first I'd like to introduce the company that we are going to be talking about today, Eris. Eris is an Australian technology provider for the defence and national security sector, specialising in data science and infrastructure engineering with a focus on machine learning and artificial intelligence. They connect world-renowned applied technology expertise with former defence and national security personnel to deliver leading edge technology and advisory services. And Eris is jointly led by Grant Joy, who's joining us here today, and Jake Carroll. During Grant's 16 years in the Australian Army, he led operational capabilities and provided advisory services for defence leadership. Grant's military service is complemented with his experience in management consulting, risk advisory and operations management in the defence, resources, finance and health sectors. Grant is passionate about supporting positive change for national security and border protection and improving the capabilities of defence and national security professionals with current and leading edge AI technologies. Welcome, Grant. Thanks, Sue. Uh, with Eris being a side hustle for Jake, he is also the Chief Technology Officer of the Research Computing Centre for the University of Queensland. Jake brings over 15 years of experience in supercomputing, data management, computer science, and large-scale infrastructure projects to the Eris team. He is regarded in industry as a global leader of innovative storage and compute platforms at a national scale. Jake's focus is in the delivery of capability and value through cutting edge technologies, understanding the fine line that exists between consistent service <clears throat> and performance. Yes, welcome, Jake. Thanks, Sue. So uh, I'd like uh, for everyone just to notice that uh, as we're going through, there is uh, the ability to use the chat function and also to ask questions via the Q&A function. And at the end of Jake and Grant's presentation, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to hand over to Grant and Jake to give us their presentation and tell us more about what Eris is doing in this space. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sue, and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to share our collective experience, both within uh, defence and also within research computing. Um, you know, we're in some amazing companies, part of the Straight Out of Queensland uh, webinar presentation series. We're, we're quite humbled to be here, um, particularly noting that we've only officially been up and running for the last three months. Uh, I certainly want to kick off with a, a special acknowledgement to our defence and national security personnel deployed uh, in Australia and throughout the world. It's, a, it's quite a tough time for them at the moment to be in service of the country and our state. So we can uh, continue to appreciate your, uh, your commitment. Uh, you know, I'd like to start off with, you know, a little story about, you know, how a soldier and a computer scientist walked into a bar. Um, I met this, uh, this chap over here uh, in the fog of war that, that some might recognise as a business economics class at the University of Queensland's School of Business. Uh, we were actually able to fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to, to team up on a group assignment, which really allowed us to spend some time discussing the nature of each other's work mm. uh, and our experience. Uh, from myself, uh, as per Sue's introduction before, uh, I've spent about 16 years in defence, primarily working in roles, advising key decision makers on both the battle space and the adversary. Uh, I've also held some capability leadership roles. Um, here in Brisbane, uh, and I've spent a good chunk of my time of my life deployed uh, on defence missions around the world. Um, I guess for me, you know, my journey started in what would be considered a normal tech world you know, as a sysadmin involving myself in the usual kind of mundane things in, in the research and higher ed sector. But uh, I quickly got bored of that and I, I set sail into actual research uh, into the kind of the deep strange world of research computing and computer science. And I, I never really looked back from there. And I got involved in the health sector um, to an extent, you know, further than that, the, the deep research sector and the supercomputing sector. Uh, and it became, you know, to me, a vibrant, passionate place to be because I got an opportunity to actually make a, a bit of a difference to the world um, and do other bigger things. 
Um, so we realized while, while we we're at UQ that we had the opportunity to start tinkering with some technology solutions specific for defense problem, um, mainly around the employment of AI machine learning for providing greater insight into data. Uh, we brought in some uh, of my like-minded colleagues from defense and defense industry to help shape, validate and, and build upon some of those ideas. Uh, and we've certainly brought along uh, technologists like Jake to, to assist us with developing those. Um, you know, these images here represent the, the public's association with the Australian Defence Force and our federal and state government public safety agencies, as well as the national intelligence community. The Department of Defence and the ADF alone have a workforce of approximately 58,000 staff uh, across Australia and the world. Um, this workforce is obviously incorporating the, the Navy, the Army and the Air Force, um, but there's also, you know, eight uh, enabling groups such as the Joint Capabilities Group and the Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group. And added into this market for us are the state police and emergency response organisations, as well as the 10 agencies of the national intelligence community. Uh, under Defence's uh, Defence Strategic Update released earlier this year, um, those strategic objectives uh, were realigned and they are to deploy military power to shape Australia's strategic environment, deter actions against our interests, and when required, uh, respond with credible military force. Uh, these objectives will bring $270 billion of funding over the next decade uh, for new and upgraded defence capabilities and platforms. And the four structure plan outlines that funding will be set aside to ensure defence remains competitive in future uh, emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence. You know, this, this investment really offers the opportunity for defence to work with industry partners to strengthen the Australian industrial base uh, to advance these technological areas. Uh, importantly for defence and national security, it, it really is an industry almost like every other, and that particularly they have a, a really strong and enabled uh, back end that enables warfighters to do what they are best at. Um, they have planning capabilities, operations, logistics, communications, HR, intelligence, maintenance, policy, the whole lot. Um, and it's certainly it's common uh, to look at the warfighting function of the ADF where, for where AI and machine learning can provide the greatest value. Uh, however, it's that non-warfighting functional areas that ag industry agnostic AI and machine learning can be developed, tested, evaluated and implemented with reduced risk uh, and with the added advantage of cross-industry experience, people, people like Jake and other people within our team. Uh, it's really important from us uh, and from our perspective to, to maintain and support uh, sovereign industry and companies like Eris uh, have been established to support the Australian government's goal for a strategic sovereign defence industry with the capability, resilience uh, to help meet Australia's needs to the greatest extent possible within our own borders. And that's a quote directly from Minister Pine from a couple of years ago. Um, you know, we have the, the strong motivation to ensure that IP stays here in Australia for the benefit of all Australians, and we want to be able to contribute to Australia's sovereign defence industry by delivering Australian-owned and Australian-made technology. So, so where to start? Um, you know, the leaders at the United States Joint AI Centre, uh, the Jake, not that Jake, the other Jake, uh, believe that AI will... Uh, eventually impact every war fighting domain and every future US DOD mission. And we couldn't agree any, any more with that. Um, so we looked at how we could analyze the breadth of the opportunity within defense and NATSEC. Uh, and after having examined the, the various ways that Australia and its partners break down military capability, we decided to look at the problem through the lens of the centuries old common staff system, uh, which you can see in the center of the slide there outlined in red. Um, drawing on our experience, we, we drew out dozens uh, of, of low-hanging fruit problems that defence and NATSEC personnel face every day uh, in each one of those nine categories there. Uh, and then with the support of Jake uh, and our engineering staff, you know, we align those problems with, with current AI and ML technologies that could feasibly be integrated into existing systems. You know, that, that approach of starting with, with low-hanging fruit certainly you know, does reduce risk. Uh, and will hopefully um, you know, allow technology to be deployed uh, quicker uh, to the warfighter where it's needed the most. Yeah. So <clears throat> on that, I think there's something to be said to begin with in, in that low hanging fruit kind of value prop, but more 
AI often, as we all know, as many people on, on this webinar today will, will be very familiar with, it has these very bright, shiny connotations about it still, uh, and, it, and it will continue to for some time yet as, the, you know, as, as this industry advances. Uh, what, what we're seeing at the moment, which I'll get into a little bit later, is kind of you know, peak, peak AI. I call it the year of NLP, but we'll get into it a little bit later. I think you know, at this stage, you know, applying um, AI and ML um, in the national security space uh, can actually be uh, easier and more fluid um, than than the grandiose projects which people have proposed. So, you know, broadly, you know, we're enabling other technologies in effect as a knock-on. Um, there's got to be a centralised direction to what we're doing as well, um, and there has to be some standards put around it. So, you know, Grant and I, we we love the startup mentality. You know, we we've, we've come from a world that kind of digs into that and really kind of engages with it. But at the same time, we have to think about the structures and the systems and the users behind all of this as well, because we're not just building a building a, a fun thing. We're building a a capable thing that will be deployed later on in some special way, and it has other connotations to it. So. You know, there's a strong requirement for, I guess, foundational development, data management, infrastructure engineering. Um, you know, the, the JAIC kind of called this, they called this plumbing. They called this the plumbing. And that's how the future of AI will look um, in, these, in these environments. And we have to be mindful and sensitive of that. Um, the other big thing, I think, the ethics of, of AI implementation, it's probably going to come to the front. Um, so I know you think about these things often. I know I think about these things often and we hear it in the media all the time. We talk about the ethics of AI. The good, the good in this is that there is really front foot stuff happening in the ethics of what AI looks like in defense and this national security sector. So nobody is walking into it blind. I think it's just for entities like us, um, we have to keep this really front and center. Otherwise, you know, we, we could fall into a place where we're not thinking carefully enough, right? Um, so, you know, there's workforce capability and growth as well. There's talent management and all of that in this, what we're doing as we speak. Um, yeah, move on. Okay, so let's talk about challenges. Uh, so every sector has them. Um, I think ours are, they're interesting and they're unique and there's some interesting uh, eccentricities to this sector, which I am fresh to. Um, and I will say I am naive and I am fresh to. Um, and, you know, with my colleagues, I am learning a lot quickly about how this all looks, right? Uh, and the differences. So, you know, the complexities of understanding the problem space are numerous. Um, there's things that are easily boxed in some ML spaces and some AI spaces. There's things that are not so much in this space. Um, you know, I, I can think of things uh, where you've got recommender systems uh, online where, you know, you might have a handbag or something like that that looks good based upon a profile. Um, this space looks a little bit different. Than that. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a few different eccentricities about the criticality of what we do um, and the urgency of what we do that need to be weighed into all of those things. You know, there's classified systems, there's data management, and the management of data in itself is complex. Um, you know, gone are the days where we can say, let's build a data lake and have some fun with that. It's got to have no look sideways approaches. It needs to be considered a little bit more uh, a little bit differently. Um, otherwise, you're kind of breaking some core tenets of how things um, are required to look for validation and valid uh, validation and verification. The supply chain complexity in what we do. So you know we hear all the time about, and there was recently articles published uh, as little as a year ago about supply chain issues in some of the hyperscalers. So we're talking Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, so on and so forth. Uh, we have to consider those things too in, you know, the sensitivity around supply chains. Are we, are we taking ownership of ASICs and FPGAs that have been, um, you know, tampered with? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a possibility, right? I have stories about these things where I can, I can talk about that in another, in another avenue. Um, the other thing, I guess, is the difficulty of acquisition and experimentation in space. Grant touched upon it before about, you know, how we how we approach uh, innovation in, in a space of this level of complexity. And um, one of the things, you know, which is everybody's talking about lately, it's the thing beyond, you know, DevOps, it's MLOps, which I'm sure there's people on, people on the webinar today have heard that term. You know, we talk about agile pro project life cycles and all those things, but how do you de-risk things uh, to an extent that they are palatable to such a, a complex market? How do you get them to a point where your partners and the people who rely on you to make sure this thing will work are de-risked enough for them to actually have faith in it. And that's a thing that we have to consider as well. The appetite for risk looks different uh, in this space. So 
where this differ, where we differ kind of in criticality, I think. So there's computational correctness to consider. That's a whole other technical discussion in itself. You know, uh, it could be the difference between success and a really serious problem. Um, and when I say serious, well, think about the implications. Uh, one of the reasons Grant actually referenced these low hanging fruit to begin with, right? Um, let's look at things that impact people materially in efficiency. Um, let's not look yet at the complexities of, you know, really complex battle space, for example. These are big problems to solve. Um, you know, there's diligence to be paid in the way we assess risk. Um, you know, like I mentioned, the, the recommender concept, you know, handbags and cat trees on eBay. We're dealing with materially different things here. Um, you know, you might get one go at a thing, and that's pretty serious. Um, we probably should crack open the, the consideration as well of explainability. Um, you know, we've got to talk about that kind of thing. You've got the year of NLP, as I call it. Right? Um, you know, if we consider what BERT's done this year, if we consider where GPT-3's gone and OpenAI and Electra, um, you know, massive things have happened this year. So much so, I'm pretty sure, again, there'll be several people on this webinar today who know about what happened on Reddit recently with the, with the GPT-3 trained bot, which somebody ended up figuring out wasn't real. Uh, but it got pretty interesting there in the way the thing was spitting things back out. You know, I'm sure some of you have read it. But, you know, the point of, you know, AI governance, fairness and decision science is on the rise there. Um, and you have to wonder a little bit about just how open some of these things are. Um, so, you know, for my own part, let's look at GPT-3 and open AI. How open is the thing that you buy as a service model? And we don't know how it was trained exactly. Right? So we'd really need to be a little bit careful about those things. So in the future, you know, the decision makers, um, you know, uh, across the country in national security um, and our colleagues in Canberra, um, they really need to be able to stand by the recommendations made by all of these things. So correctness and explainability will become king. This is not about black boxes. Uh, it's about being sure, right? Um, certainly one of the other things I think... Um you know, we were asked about before we before we came on today is you know what what are the things that that Eris is doing at the moment, um, and obviously you know we we can talk about some things you know it's it's standard commercial and confidence for for some of the work that we are doing for our clients, but you know I'll I'll kind of give the the high level detail as to what we're doing, and Jake will be able to dive into some of the technical aspects there as well. Um, you know, a couple of things we got going on at the moment. Firstly, you know, we've developed a uh, machine learning enabled uh, research and analysis tool, um, which is enabling uh, effectively a, a researcher or an analyst to, to take in open source information uh, and improve the understanding and insight that they're getting from various sources across um, the open source domain. Um, you know, that has been a capability enhancer um, for, that, for that analyst uh, and has enabled them really to you know, improve their understanding and insight into very complex technical queries which are being asked of them on a daily, weekly and monthly basis. Um, secondly, you know, we're actually providing uh, some advice uh, to the University of Queensland's Defence Innovation Bridge project. Um, you know, an amazing project being, being led by Cameron Turner, the entrepreneur in residence uh, out at UQ Business School. Uh, and they're looking at, you know, that problem solution fit and problem market fit with regards to defence and, you know, high-end tech in general, but specifically around machine learning and AI. Uh, and the student researchers out there have done some amazing work to really dive into, you know, what some of those low-hanging fruit problems are uh, within defence uh, and then using, you know, a range of industry partners such as us to, to confirm and validate the, the feasibility of some of those applications. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, one of the, the interesting um, activities we did earlier this year was around uh, enabling open source uh, information uh, with regards to financial transactions uh, and looking at, um, you know, common patterns of interest uh, on the internet to hopefully identify, you know, when the next bad event will actually occur. Uh, and I'll probably let Jake explain a little bit more uh, about that one. Yeah, sure. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, bad out there in, in you know, financial fraud, um, amongst other things, you know, cryptocurrency comes to mind. Uh, I guess we spent a little bit of time really picking apart you know, the, the, the simplistic ways that one can actually do good open source intelligence uh, in this space. And one of the things that I think Grant and I have resonated on over the course of 
you know, the last year or so, only the last couple of months is, you know, really coming online, um, is look at the simple things first. You know, we, we started looking at these fragments of what we're finding out there online uh, using some, you know, what we consider rudimentary techniques, but, you know, what our clients and colleagues are looking at going, wow, you guys managed to aggregate that stuff and make sense and make inference of these things by using some pretty sensible techniques to actually trap and trace and make inference. And you know, we talk about inference a lot in this space. Uh, and that proved incredibly powerful and, and incredibly efficient. So we can gain insight and you know, actionable intelligence relatively easily um, by using some basic tools. And it, it says to me that the age of ML and AI have really come to hand in that you know, if we can put these things together in a, in a relatively simple way in a short amount of time, and the world is all of our oyster at the moment. And that's the positive in this, you know, we can do good and we can do it quickly. Probably, you know, um, before we do, you know, take on some questions, um, you know, some closing points from us noting that we have actually shot through it pretty, pretty quickly this oh, morning, but yeah. um, you know, defense and, and national security are just like every other customer, but they do have their own nuances there. Uh, and particularly when it comes to understanding, you know, complex, uh, and varied organisational structures, uh, cultural norms, yep. uh, jargon. We have a, a, a no TLA three-letter acronym rule uh, in this office because uh, I am just as guilty uh, as the chap in the maroon shirt next to me uh, when it comes to using industry jargon. Yep. Um, but you know there are a range of providers out there, not just us, um, that have you know a range of experience uh, into defence and national security. Uh, and you only have to look to the United States in particular in terms of how they are managing um, the link between um, government in general uh, and industry uh, and some of the, um, the connectors of, of the fabric there that are helping bring those together, whether that's from a, um, you know, a capital perspective, um, a connection and research perspective, or the deployment of technology itself. There's some, there's some amazing organisations in the US doing some great work and on, on that, just on that, I would say I'm, I'm refreshed and amazed a little bit and happy to see just how fluid some of those interactions actually are, right? So as a person that's come in from the outside of this space to understand it and learn about it and see what I thought was a really locked down and closed world where people didn't talk to each other freely and to see the way people are interacting in the research space and the corporate space over there and the way they're linking these things together with a few really capable people driving that it was really nice to see it's not what i expected right so it's refreshing but certainly you know those those barriers to entry exist uh in the us as well as here in australia sure, sure. uh and you know we're certainly doing our best to to scramble across some of those barriers uh and to also help you know the ecosystem uh connect in the right places in defense as well uh and you know a really good example of that we we don't do robotics uh we're not involved in the robotics side um, but certainly there's a range of AI ML techniques that some of the robotics partners that we're working with, they, they need, um, you know, they don't necessarily have the understanding of defense and what defense wants to get out of that robotic platform, whether it's uh, as an ISR sensor or for some ability to affect, um, you know, and shape the, the battle space itself. Um, but certainly, you know, by, by having a, a team of people where we can connect, you know, um, smart and experienced technologists uh, with people like myself who do have a degree of experience within defense. Um, you know, we've been able to be relatively successful so far. Uh, and certainly, you know, there's a lot of good opportunities out there, you know, not just for um, small businesses in Queensland, but also for defense industry uh, in general. Um, so they're the, they're the key points we, we really wanted to cover today. Uh, hopefully that provided some, some information as to, you know, how AI and ML, you know, can have an impact within defence and, and national security. Uh, and we'd certainly be, uh, you know, we're certainly looking forward to taking some questions uh, from the forum. Great. Thanks, Grant. And thanks, Joy. Uh, Grant, sorry. Thanks, Grant. And thanks, Jake. Um, so we do have a question, but I wanted to, um, to just ask, uh, you've, you've painted a, you know, a picture that defence is actually very similar to other sectors, but, you know, with a degree of uh, scale and complexity that is not necessarily found uh, in, uh, exactly the same in other sectors. But, 
you know, you also mentioned that with some of the technologies uh, and some of the work that you're doing for for other people, they seem really um, advanced. Um, but really, in defence, is is it is this a sector that we can learn from? In as much as defence has to be good at taking on new technologies and has to be good at being able to communicate that information and having those technologies deployed. Uh, you know, whole scale, you know, wholesale across the whole sector. What is it that, you know, other sectors could learn from defence in terms of, you know, once a decision has been made to take up these technologies, how you can uh, deploy them? Um, certainly from my side, you know, the um, assurance piece that defence does with ICT in general, um, you know, ensures that our networks remain safe and secure. Um, and, and when our warfighters are doing their job uh, in Australia or overseas, uh, and when um, our support and enabling staff are doing their job, you know, we don't really have much opportunity for systems to go down in general. Uh, and so certainly, you know, things that I know that Defence will be working on is, is that, that plumbing that Jake mentioned before. You know, what are the, the structures, standards, infrastructure, architecture look like so that we can do you know, rapid tests and evaluation of simple or complex uh, AI machine learning uh, to enable you know, um, a, a guy or a girl on the ground, wherever they are around the world. So um, that's one thing that I think defense does um, quite well, um, but certainly you know, um, having worked with, with other small businesses and, and, and large businesses, things like documentation and governance tend to get left towards the end sometimes. Um, you know, that's, that's where I think um, you know, there's, there's some opportunity for shared knowledge across the board. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and to touch upon something you said, so you talked about the, the, the creation of, of a platform or a product and then distributing it widely and getting it out there at scale. So, you know, buzzword at the moment, you know, doing things at scale. I think there's room um, and, you know, looking at it from the, the opposite direction entirely, there is a lot of room um, to move in the CICD approaches. So we talk about continuous integration, continuous development. There is a lot of that that can arc up quick. Um, and it is well understood, it is robust, um, and it is well rehearsed in the largest organizations in the world now. And I think the new breed of defense and what comes next is well aware of it. Um, and I think to that end, that scale up and the way they get things out there, robustly engineered, done A-B testing, all that kind of thing, that's what comes next. And that's what's happening as we speak. Great, all right. Well, I'll field some questions that have come up from the attendees. Uh, first from Rach, uh, thanks guys. Fascinating and eye-opening discussion. What are your thoughts when it comes to legalities of AI and ML use? How do you envisage this being managed into the future, particularly in the defence space, not just domestically, but internationally? Um, so like, like Jake mentioned before about the ethics and assurance, um, the legal application of machine learning and AI is certainly one of those things that's being examined um, and will continue to be examined as part of the, the plumbing uh, that, that is going on. Um, Defence defense don't typically take these things uh, lightly. Um, you know, there are a strong legal teams that look into things like uh, rules of engagement uh, and orders for opening fire and, and various um, legal matters like that. Uh, and certainly, you know, the, the role of AI and machine learning um, will simply increase the, the decision cycle and the speed of that decision cycle. Um, you know, my, my personal opinion is that you know, defence will want to keep a human in the loop um, for, you know, for, for the foreseeable future. I can't see a time, to be honest, where, you know, an autonomous system um, that can deliver an effect, a specific fire effect on the ground, uh, can operate completely by itself. Uh, I think there will always have to be a human in the loop. Um, but certainly, you know, that legal approach uh, and that legal study uh, will continue to occur um, just as it has done so over the last 10 to 15 years with regards to you know, remotely piloted autonomous systems and aerial systems um, such as Predator and Reaper. And let, let's, be, let's be completely frank how current that question is. And, and thank you for that question, Rach, because it it's incredibly current given 
recent events, like let's just consider for a second what IBM and Google have recently done in terms of um, of machine vision on face detection, right? We all watched a mighty leap back from the edge, okay? We all saw a pause for concern and a pause for caution, uh, which I think was healthy. uh, And I think it was good governance on, on the leadership in IBM's behalf, amongst others. They weren't the only company that did it. But everybody just took a step back and a breather and went, we really need to consider the bigger picture impact legally, ethically, and morally of all of this. And I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, You know, killer robots, no, we're not there, but um, we could be. um, And it's probably a term that maybe makes Sue twitch. Um, But, but, you know, I I think, I think we're all, you know, the people, the people in the know and the people who are, you know, at the top of these structures are paying attention. And I think we are being cautious. Uh, and there are some questions coming in, but I'm going to sneak another one in um, because it, it relates to, to Rachel's uh, question there. And I don't know whether you're aware, but DARPA has had um, hosted a, um, I'm just trying to remember what it's called, uh, Alpha Dogfight, yep. where it pitted an AI controlled virtual F 16 against a human F 16 pilot and the AI 150. So, in terms of human in the, what does this mean for human in the loop? And, you know, is it actually responsible for us to be putting humans in the loop when AI can have that sort of track record of success? Um, I know that um, the, the topic and that event uh, have certainly been discussed on um, various forums uh, internally within Defence and then uh, on Twitter and everywhere else. Uh, I know that there's actually been some people who have had uh, stakes involved with who would win, uh, the, the human pilot or the AI pilot. Um, you know, one of the things that Defence um, trialled uh, earlier this year, late last year, is, is optionally crewed vehicles. Uh, and so optionally crewed vehicles means that, you know, there is a, uh, a human at the con, you know, when it is best to have the human there. But in instances where there is um, danger or risk, you know, the, the system can continue forward. Uh, and that optionally crewed vehicle was a, a M113 armoured personnel carrier. Uh, and certainly, you know, you just have to look at the news to see what um, Boeing are doing with the Loyal Wingman program uh, in terms of you know what do some of these capabilities look like and how will they be employed. Um, you know, I, I think that um, in terms of you know when the opportunity turns to a position of risk uh, where there is um, the likelihood that a, a pilot may not come back from that mission, um, then you know defence will uh, you know apply their standard risk methodology to it. Uh, and if one of those mitigating factors is using a autonomous or a uh, optionally crewed vehicle or even remotely piloted vehicle, uh, that is simply just another tool in the toolkit available to defence decision makers. Okay, we have a question here around security clearances and it's from Edward. He says, you noted the challenges of J1 personnel um, security clearances. Do you expect... AI to be deployed in the new security clearances ICT system as part of AGSFAR's uh, ICT 2270 and how so and are you involved? Uh, I, I can certainly say we're not involved, um, but um, you know, the security clearances and, and the Australian Government Security Vetting Agency, AGSFA, are going through a, a digital transformation uh, at the moment. Um, I'm not overly aware of the, the specifics with it. Um, you know, there's a, a number of steps involved with, with, with getting a, a government security clearance. Um, you know, there's a, a whole lot of opportunity I would see there with regards to uh, automation, uh, machine learning, uh, and effectively improving the speed and accuracy. Validation as well. And, validation. And, and validation side. Um, and certainly, you know, if, if AGSVA or other agencies were looking at, at you know, utilising that technology I, I would suggest that they'd, they'd be on the on the money yeah I think uh, there's there's a bit to be learned uh, and a bit of integration work to do and some time that has to take you know it's, it's course there has to be water flow under the bridge so to speak in terms of the level of confidence which is required to to get that to a point where it needs to be certainly recommend the platforms um, and 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 good uh, good NLP systems could go a long way in this space and and it will uh, but I think to begin with, it's a, it's a slow path um, and it's a path that has to be trodden with a bit of caution.
abortion. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly one of those, you know, dozens of, of problems that we have looked at. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's even smaller, simpler steps that can occur before we start, you know, fully deploying wholesale ML. Yeah, like uh, onto text, a text analytics, for example, to yeah. begin with, right? There's, there's good deep text analytics and heuristics which can be applied well before we even get into that level of complexity. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, now, uh, there's a question here on whether people can add you on LinkedIn. Um, I haven't actually checked if you're on LinkedIn. I, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, it's it's part of my 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 expansion into the commercial sector. Having lived in the, the world of army for for 16 years, I'm I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, oh, and yeah. People can certainly uh, add me or, or add Jake uh, and can follow and can follow Eris on LinkedIn. Uh, well, actually, I I noticed that Sonia has actually got your LinkedIn. Um, uh, links at the top of the, the chat box. So there people can find you pretty easy. Yep. Um, now a question from C Steve, do you see any risk in applying uh, for secure positions on PCs without verified security at endpoints, say a DNS shadow server issue? Uh, yeah, that's in a very techie question. Um, that's entirely possible. Um, there's plenty of risk in every endpoint. Uh, I think I think it's fair to say that uh, an endpoint is susceptible in um, many different circumstances, whether it be as a consequence of uh, hardware being tampered with or software platforms being tampered with. Um, DNS leaks, shadow DNS, yeah, uh, that's all possible. I guess there's layers of security, as you will you will well know. Um, you know, we talk about layered security models and layered security posture. I think if um, infrastructure planning is done correctly which you know, we, we all know there are varying degrees of done correctly, um, then at other mitigating steps and other mitigating points, you are uh, keeping yourself safe. And, and a good example of that is the widespread and popular use of platforms like WireGuard um, as we speak, which is becoming bigger and bigger um, and is ubiquitous and open. Um, if you're using platforms like that and you're encrypted all the way down um, and you're keeping every piece of traffic that flows across uh, encrypted, then look, you know, you're doing one step better for yourself and one step better for your service. Um, that's not to say that there are, there are mitigators on top of that. So it's all about layers, I think, and that's good security premise and infrastructure. Well, um, <clears throat> another technical question for you from Jay. How do you view the future of deployable AI capabilities where access to cloud computing and computer computing power may be limited? Uh, that's actually really interesting that you mentioned that. So Grant and I have uh, a whole uh, tranche of consideration and work around limited computing at the edge. Okay, So this is, this is a big thing for us at the moment. Um, so we talk a lot about this, about what constitutes what will be needed at the edge in complex spaces. Uh, and we talk about low power computing. We talk about uh, lack of bandwidth available. And um, we talk about the complexity of what's required out there. Um, I believe there is a very vibrant future and Grant could pick up on it as well from a strategic perspective. There's a vibrant future out there um, for edge based computing and edge ML and AI machine vision capabilities and decision making systems, simply because if we look at what's actually happening right now as we speak like look at the latest iteration of the Ampere chip that Nvidia have just put out. Um, not to drop you know, product, but look at what AMD are doing with Instinct. Some of these chips uh, and some of the small versions of the chips that they're putting out, um, the successor to Jetson, for example, it's amazing what you can do with these chips in such a small space with so little power and think about the amount of bandwidth that you don't need to consume to get useful information back with pre-trained models. Grant, do you want to kind of... I guess the only other uh, non-technical point I would add to it is that um, it's it's not just re with regards to an availability of of bandwidth yeah. and pipe, yeah. uh, it's the option to not have to connect to that bandwidth and pipe. Yep. Yep. Uh, and from a, a defense or a, a national security perspective, um, if there is a need to avoid plugging into bandwidth um, because you don't need to constantly have a feed going back and forth, uh, consuming valuable you know, satellite or VHF time, uh, then certainly if, if ML can be enabled you know, at the tactical edge yep. with technological edge, uh, then we certainly see you know, a role to play for that. Uh, and certainly in, in spaces such as intelligence surveillance reconnaissance in ISR, um, where you know, those, those platforms are dependent on a sensor providing a stream of data back to someone either you know, visually watching something on a screen or taking in data on the back of a, a, an aircraft, 
then if that's processed at the edge and the bandwidth is is saved, uh, then there's a whole stack of operational gains to be made from it. Okay, thank you. Edward has actually posted a link and given a bit of information on the ICT 2270 vetting transformation project, if anybody is interested. Um, moving on to a question from Dale. With the vast amount of data available to be collected from open sources, are you considering integrating your OSINT platform into military intelligence operations? And if so, what applications do you see it being used? Uh, and for example, fusing an ISR feed from a UAS with a reverse image search conducted by an analyst. Uh, th that, that approach uh, sounds remarkably familiar. Um, but certainly uh, with regards to integrating our, our current capabilities uh, with existing defence um, platforms, we, we haven't gotten to that stage just yet. Um, but certainly as part of our engineering uh, work and concept design work, uh, we're ensuring that anything that, that we do develop could integrate with a system further on down the track uh, and certainly one of the, the challenges that ev even we have is, you know, what, what are those systems that Defence is using and our, and our partners are using at the moment? Um, because, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a handful of, uh, you know, OSINT uh, collection tools. There's a, there's a handful of, of analytical tools being used on various Defence uh, ICT networks. Um, you know, what does that input output look like for us? Um, but again, fortunately, because we're, we're building stuff um, you know, relatively uh, simply from the ground up, yeah. uh, it means that um, you know, we can test iterate uh, as we go uh, a lot quicker. Uh, and you know, certainly if there's a, a functional requirement to plug you know, something that we have into, you know, let's, let's say you know, Palantir or I2, yeah. uh, then you know, that just becomes another requirement that we have to meet. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the realm of pluggability and uh, API-driven environments, I think, is is king. Um, and I don't think anyone would really, really doubt that, that you know, the, the API is, is where the world is. Um, I think it's about kind of working and unifying on you know, how we communicate and how we interoperate better. As Grant said, there's a handful of these things kicking around. Whether they've been developed in unison or in concert is another matter entirely, right? And that's the, that's the complexity. Interoperability is, is a big thing now. Well, while I give people a little bit more time to think of questions, uh, I'm, I've got a curly one for you. I don't know whether you heard, but yesterday our Prime Minister actually said that Australia should be uh, good technology adopters and not worry about being technology creators. And yet my understanding was a few years ago when we made the decision to invest 2% of our GDP into defence, that that was largely on the basis that it was considered that the development of defence technology and developing defence technology export markets was uh, going to be w one of the key principles of the investment of the, those funds. So would you like to make any comment? Uh, I, I haven't read the Prime Minister's statement from yesterday. Um, I'll, I'll be sure to ask him when I'm in Canberra next week. Um, <laughs> but certainly, um, you know, defence uh, and government in general you know, has, a, has a, a good strong history of engaging with multinational partners to provide defence capability. Um, you know, there has been a push over the last uh, few years, um, even from within Prime Minister Morrison's party, uh, about you know, pursuing a, a, that sovereign industry to, to help you know, Team Australia stand up on its own two feet. Um, you know, I, I think the, the blend will always be there. Um, you know, we, we don't have the, the, the scale. Um, we don't necessarily have the, the full workforce that we need to develop very complex systems here in Australia, which is why, you know, we do have, um, you know, those defence primes come to Australia, help with upskilling, um, help us build that technology. Um, you know, and in time, I, I think that we'll be able to, to certainly do that. Um, However, when I think it com when it comes to software, I think we do have that uh, expertise, you know, here in here in country, um, and so uh, I think you know adopting technologies from overseas, yeah, absolutely. If it's something that you know we don't have, or it's simply going to take too long, um, and we will lose the strategic edge by not having that capability, then you know certainly I I, I get that um, that I get that point. 
Um, but if we have any opportunity to, to grow some of it, you know, within Team Australia uh, or repurpose existing technologies that are out there for whatever defence purposes are required, then I think that should also be looked at. Yeah, my view isn't too different. I guess it has, I guess it has a slightly different colour to it, as you would expect, given, given the sector I, I play in so often. Um, I think there is a very vibrant opportunity in our country to, to do some of the world's best, if not the best things with what we've got and the capability we have. And I hold a great deal of optimism um, and positivity for the things that my kids might do um, in terms of STEM. Uh, and yes, it's the world I grew up in. Um, and yes, it's what I've been saturated in my whole life, you know, from since I was a little kid. But I really do believe that we have the best possible shot at it and it will thrive either way. That is my take. Thanks for that. Now, um, moving straight into another hot question uh, from Jay. Who owns the decisions made by an AI system from a legal standpoint? Is there a risk that decision ownership becomes blurred? How would that impact decisions made in fluid environments such as combat? And do you see algorithm makers having to vet their systems? Uh, I certainly, you know, with regard to the, the last, um, last point there, then yes, you know, vetting assurance uh, and explainability uh, of any AI on any defense system will be, will be critical uh, and will, you know, I'm sure be a, a functional performance requirement uh, down the track. Uh, with regards to, to who owns the decision, um, you know, at the moment, a, a commander uh, on the ground, he or she owns that decision. Um, they will take advice on from people. They will take advice on from data, uh, and they will take advice on um, from any any means possible. Uh, yet, you know, part of that those cultural norms I spoke about earlier means that you know a, a commander owns that decision. Um, you know, unless we're talking necessarily about not having that human in the loop. Um, then you know that that person on the ground, the, the key decision maker, whether it's at a, a tactical level, you know, a, a rifle section commander, uh, through to the strategic level, um, you know, that person will still have the um, the responsibility for making that decision and being accountable for that decision. Um, and um, you know, AI and machine learning will simply be, I think, for the foreseeable future. Um, simply a aid to that decision maker. So, so on that, and and to kind of to put put the academic color on top of that, I think um, there's a there's what is evolving, and it was it was touched upon a little bit in what I talked about earlier in the slides. We're, we're going beyond simply data science, and we're moving towards decision and deliberation science. Um, and this is this is something where um, you know, the robotic space, which Sue is an expert in, could talk about deliberation and and you know the autonomous nature of how things make decisions but decision science is coming to the front edge, right? So this whole subset of how decisions get made, the ways in which decisions get biased, the ways in which they actually deliberate things and how those deliberation matters actually come to pass is actually being very heavily scrutinised at the moment in, in you know, a lot of really deep, deep research. And I think that will feed into ultimately how a person makes a decision and the recommendations they are given on the ground when something is critical. It's a pretty robust and mature question, actually. Thank you. It's really interesting. Okay, moving on to another question. You started off your presentation, I guess, outlining how you both met. And of course, that's also how I met both of you through yes. the UQ MBA program. And, you know, it's interesting that you ended up working on a joint project together. And clearly your experiences of uh, joint projects uh, was more successful than mine during my MBA. Although no, that's not true. I actually still have some good friends who I worked on uh, projects with, but perhaps also some people that I never want to see again. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I guess this is leading into a question around your collaboration process, uh, because you do have a team that comes from very different technical and non-technical backgrounds. So uh, how do you manage that? Or do you think you were just fortunate in who you got paired with in that MBA project? I'll go first here and then Grant could go. Uh, we met in some pretty unusual, uncertain circumstances. Um, we had, uh, uh, no names will be mentioned, we had a very unusual lecturer. Uh, and and he, was, he was eccentric uh, to say the least. Um, Grant and I kind of found commonality um, 
in uh, understanding and trying to get our head around uh, the eccentricities of that specific lecturer. Um, and, and trust me, he was wild. So, so it, there was six cans of Red Bull before lunch. Um, so, so he was, he was an unusual fellow and some of the things that he talked about kind of got us, got us talking, but in terms of collaboration, um, I think what makes what we're doing here a little bit different and possibly a little bit special and something that I'm really enjoying is we do have vastly different initial views of how things operate in the world. We both understand business, but we both see this, we, we, we have this vastly different view of where we've come from and where we have to go. There's common goals and there's a lot of commonality in the way we see things. Um, but I think what's what's happened over time is and this thing that happens when you, you go through the MBA and the process of leadership, you actually get to learn a little bit about each other and you can pick people, you can spot people at a distance and go, I know the kind of person that probably is, and I know the kind of things that I want to do with life, and I know the kind of person I want to operate with. Um, and I think Grant and I were fortunate in it, and we found that really, really easily through shared experiences. You know? um, yeah, I, yeah. One observation I'll make is that um, people who come out of the research sector have a very similar motivation to those who come out of defence and national security. Um, there is that sense of wanting to do good uh, for the greater good. Um, and for the Commonwealth of Australia as well. Uh, and so certainly Jake and I have got that, that alignment, which, which makes you know, coming to work every day that much more enjoyable. Um, however, it, it is a process of constant learning uh, from both sides. For both of us. Um, both of us. Yeah, we have the, the no TLA rule because um, there's a lot of what Jake talks about that I, I don't have the technical knowledge of. And uh, vice and, versa. Right? And, and when I talk about crazy defence stuff, um, you know, Jake's eyes start to glaze over. Um, but the collaboration part, you know, even extends to part of our engineering team yep. where, you know, they're not here in Brisbane with us. You know, um, one of our engineers is in South Australia on a farm. She, um, she, she walks her goat daily. And, uh, you know, she, she's got uh, an amazing background having worked in the intelligence community before. But, um, you know, we have to adjust how we work every day yep. um, because of the tyranny of distance, mm -hmm. uh, but also because we come from different backgrounds. And, you know, regularly we, we find opportunities to, you know, share stuff with each other. And one I shared with Jake mm -hmm. yesterday was, uh, a presentation from um, the US Naval Postgraduate School um, in California, um, where um, General Jack Shanahan was one of the guest lecturers and he was the former uh, director of the US Joint AI Center. Uh, an amazing um, you know, webinar that he led, um, but to share that with Jake and I often get tech stuff back, that's, that's how we seem to be able to do yep. it. Yep. And, and that, I, I guess I got a lot of learning from that in that one of the things I thought I was going to receive was a lot of really complicated, um, I guess, military bias focused discussion, a lot of doctrine that I didn't really understand. What I got from it was, wow, this is really, you know, in the same realm of my head and how we speak and how we operate. This isn't so different after all. Um, this is making sense to me. Uh, and that, that really helps me. But I guess the bigger picture of all this, if you want to talk you know, strategic human resources and how we all play. Um, diversity is where the space is. Uh, and, and look, you know, we all know it. We all know the studies are there. We all know that diversity in, in backgrounds and thinking and upbringing and family and all those things, and, and importantly, gender. Oh, gosh, importantly, gender is so important. Our team is, is, is already there. You know, we've got males, we've got females, we've got people from all walks of life, and it's happening already. Um, never can truer words be spoken. Diversity is king or queen. <laughs> <laughs> all right well it looks like we've actually come to the end of the questions from the um, attendees so is there anything any final words that you have um no i mean we're, we're again just to echo my point from the start we're, we're very proud to be part of this series um for, for straight out of queensland and and we've been keeping tabs on you know, the AI community for, you know, quite a few years, um, you know, as far back as when, when Jake, um, you know, collaborated with a few other people uh, way back when it kind of kicked off. But, yep. um, you know, we're always open to, to chatting with, with other technology businesses in Queensland um, about their aspirations with defence as well. And we are genuine to see, you know, defence industry, particularly with regards to AI machine learning, grow within Queensland. Uh, and so certainly, you know, we welcome anyone, um, you know, dropping into our office at Red Hill 
uh, or reaching out to us via LinkedIn um, just to, to open that conversation with us. But um, thanks to you, Sue, for, for hosting today's uh, webinar. It's Absolutely. been an absolute yeah. pleasure for us to join you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, no, thank you, Grant, and thank you, Jake, and uh, thank you, Eris, for, for joining us on Straight Out of Queensland. I'd like to remind uh, everyone who's attending today to just have a quick look in the chat. Uh, we'll be able to, we will have a recording of this webinar up on our website if there's anything that you would like to check later, as well as on our YouTube channel, where you can also find past editions of Straight Out of Queensland. Thank you for everyone attending today. And uh, we'll close it there and uh, look forward to speaking to an, another great Queensland company in the future. Thank you. Thank you.